Hi and welcome. This is session five's primer for you for Busy 1010. The aim of this primer, this session, is just to help you identify and employ ethical approaches to morality and to reasoning. When you look at this picture, what do you think motivated this man to volunteer his time to helping others? What moved him to work with Habitat for Humanity to build a home for people he doesn't know? Very interesting. The association of morality with happiness and a sense of well-being is found in moral philosophies throughout the world. Studies support the claim that people who put moral values above non-moral concerns are happier and more self-fulfilled. So moral values are really important in our lives and are, form a part of our critical thinking arsenal and process. There are non-moral or instrumental values. Moral values are those that benefit not only myself but also others and are worthwhile because they're intrinsically worthwhile. Not because they have pragmatic value, not because they're useful, but just because they're worthwhile. They include altruism, compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, and justice. Non-moral values, on the other hand, are not bad, but they're goal-oriented. They're a means to an end that we wish to achieve. Non-moral values in include things like independence, prestige, fame, popularity, and wealth. All of which, as we know, are very transient and very ephemeral. They can last for a moment and disappear. When we fail to take appropriate moral action or make a decision we might later regret, we call this a moral tragedy. And I've included the example of Travis Lewis, a 19-year-old Brock University student who got really concerned about the amount of uh, recycling that was going into trash because proper recycling bins had not been supplied. And he took action. His critical thinking, his moral uh, perspective moved him to take action. And uh, he posted this video on YouTube. You can see it in the, uh, in the session uh, outline. You'll be able to watch the video in there. We might even overlay it on here for you. But it's just a great example of a person who didn't allow moral tragedy, but actually his conscience was moved and he acted. And so conscience is a really important thing, and uh, we'll talk some more at a later stage about how conscience is formed, both in terms of our sociology, our education, our upbringing, our national identity. But conscience is important because it provides us with knowledge about what is right and wrong. I read an article recently where the author said, don't ever feel bad when you feel bad. That's a good thing. When your conscience is activated, don't feel bad about that. It can make us feel uncomfortable but it's a good sign. In fact, they say that employers should look for people who have a sensitive conscience because it means they'll be loyal, trustworthy, and will stay aligned to their values, even under pressure. Conscience is really important. And so we need to understand that conscience is innate, it's nurtured, and it can be neglected. We see in people in whom conscience is neglected that uh, there can be really pathological and destructive outcomes when people don't develop their conscience. It has an affective uh, impact on our lives, an emotional ele element that motivates us to act on right and wrong. Effective moral reasoning involves listening to the affective side of our conscience as well as the cognitive side. And so the emotional side of our conscience, which moves us to this uncomfortable feeling, as well as the rational logical, which says A plus B equals this is wrong, but I also feel wrong about this. It doesn't feel right. Uh, we need to listen to both elements. Moral sentiments are emotions that alert us to moral situations and motivate us to do what is right. In our first session, we looked at the tank man who stood in front of those tanks in Tiananmen Square. He was moved with the emotion at the wrongs, at the injustice that he sensed were going on in his country, and it moved him to take action. There are these things called helpers high, and Bill Clinton wrote a book uh, on giving in which he pointed out that the research shows that uh, we release endorphins when we do good things for other people, and we feel good about that. And uh, likewise, when we have compassion, uh, moral outrage, and resentment, and there are things we ought to resent in life uh, that uh, are being done that are wrong. We ought to have moral outrage when those who are weak or innocent are being uh, uh, acted upon by those who have power. We need, to, we need to have outrage at that. And so we identify these things, helpers high, occurs when you experience an endorphin rush after helping others. Empathy or sympathy is the capacity 
Four, an inclination to imagine the feelings of others. Try to always put yourself in the other person's shoes when you're talking with them. How would I feel if I was listening to myself say these things? How would I feel if, this per if I acted upon myself in this way? Or if this person did to me what I'm doing to them? And so we need to empathize. We need to be able to enter into their shoes. And then, of course, compassion is sympathy in action, which means moving to help another, even when sometimes... Uh, we feel they may not deserve it. Taking steps to relieve others' unhappiness. That's compassion. Moral outrage, moral indignation occurs when we witness an injustice or violation of moral decency. Resentment is a type of moral outrage that occurs when we ourselves are treated unjustly, and that's why it's so important many times for the way police officers treat those who are charged with a crime that they do it in a way that doesn't create resentment or a moral outrage, that we're still treated, a person is still treated with dignity and respect. And that applies to many different things. A, a specialist who uh, is, a, is an orthopedic specialist or a, or a pediatrician, the way they treat the parents to ensure that there's not moral outrage, and that comes down to empathy and compassion. And then guilt. Guilt is a very important thing, as we've said, in terms of conscience. It alerts us and motivates us to correct a wrong. We're not to live under guilt, but guilt's a great sensory perception that says, hey, something's wrong here, and we need to deal with it. Guilt results when we commit a moral wrong or violate a moral principle. This is different to shame. I had a friend who did a PhD on shame and was always talking to me about what, what the difference between guilt and shame is. Shame occurs as a result of a violation of a social norm or as a result of failure to live up to others' expectations. And we can feel shame when we really oughtn't to, when we really don't need to, uh, because that's other people's expectations that may be valid or non-valid. And we have to assess that for ourselves. And so guilt and shame are two different things. And then there's real guilt and imagined guilt. Real guilt is when I am forensically guilty, when I have transgressed a known uh, rule, especially in terms of my own moral compass. I feel guilty. That's real guilt. And then there's imagined guilt. And that often relates to shame. I can give you an example of imagined guilt is where you'll be in a conversation, you'll be talking to someone, you'll say something, you'll go away and you'll say, wow, I said this, I feel bad. I wonder if that offended them. I wonder if that hurt their feelings. I wonder if, and you'll feel this imagined guilt that isn't really necessary because you haven't done anything wrong. And then you feel shame. You feel less. You always tell people who are struggling with shame, uh, in conversations, they tend not to engage. They tend many times to feel less than. They withdraw. And oftentimes we have to help people who are struggling with shame to say, hey, what is it that you feel shameful about? And is that realistic? Is it, is it rational? There's a great book called Boundaries for Leaders by Townsend, which deals with these issues of guilt and shame in a tremendous way. And I'd encourage you to get that and read it if you can. It's a great book. Moral theories provide frameworks for understanding and explaining what makes a certain action right or wrong. How do I know what's right? How do I know what's wrong? It's all relative in our world today, is it? In a pluralistic, postmodern world, can we truly say that anything is right or wrong? We need moral theories. We need a framework by which to judge and assess certain things uh, as they confront us in our lives. Our everyday moral decisions and level of reasoning are informed by the moral theory that we accept as true even though we may have never consciously articulated that theory. Sometimes it's just inherent in who we are. And so there are two moral theories or two types of moral theories, one that is relative, one that is universal. Moral relativists claim that people create reality and that there are no universal or shared moral principles that apply to all. A moral relativist or a situationist would say that it really depends on the situation as to what is right or wrong. And it really depends on the culture as to what is right or wrong. Sometimes it can be right to do something, whereas in another context we could say that's wrong. Moral universalists, on the other hand, contend that there are absolutes that superimpose themselves onto society that cannot be transgressed no matter what the context, no matter what the situation. Moral universalists would say that it's always wrong to lie. Moral universalists would say, it's always wrong to steal. People would say, but what about if I'm lying to not hurt somebody's feelings? Uh, moral relativists would say, what if I'm stealing because my family's hungry? Is it wrong then? 
And so we have these conflicting claims between moral relativists and moral universalists. And how we synergize and integrate those is a, is a complex issue all on its own. But we need to understand our own moral reasoning. According to ethical subjectivists, morality is nothing more than personal opinion or feelings. Well, that's your opinion. That's your feeling. But I don't agree. There's no ethical absolute. Cultural relativism, the second form of moral relativism, looks to public opinion. And this is Edward Maher's contention that law is sociologically determined. And we see law shifting as public opinion shifts and customs uh, provide the reasoning for moral standards. Cultural relativism, like ethical relativism, can be used to support discrimination. We saw this in the South, uh, in slavery. We saw this, as I say, in Africa with apartheid. It was cultural relativism, where cultural mores were used to justify something that was truly morally wrong, the slavery of other human beings. Moral universalists maintain that there are universal moral principles. And this falls into four categories. In fact, there are three major ethical systems in the West, and then this fourth one that subsists as a part of those. The first one is utilitarianism. And of course, Spock is well known for utilitarianism, in which he says the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. And so what is good for all becomes what is universally moral. And that's a consequence-based ethic. Is what I'm going to do going to have the greatest benefit for the greatest amount of people? Is it going to bring the most happiness uh, to the most amount of people? In, uh, and that was Jeremy Bentham, by the way, who, who developed utilitarianism in its, in its strongest form. And then we have deontology, which uh, is a duty-based ethic. And uh, Immanuel Kant formulated uh, deontology in which he said there are uh, moral principles that are driven by duty and are right in every circumstance. We then have rights-based ethics, which is uh, justice. And people look for justice, not only, as Plato said, must we have justice, but justice must also be seen to be done so we can have a just and moral society. And of course, we have this issue of the social contract that forms uh, part of this justice system. And then we have the virtue ethics, which speaks not so much to so uh, social norms and social ethics, but rather intrinsic character. And when we look at Aristotle and Confucius, we come up with 59 uh, uh, virtues in Aristotelian and Confucian thought. And there are six main virtues that are common to both. Uh, and you can look those up. Truth, compassion, humanity. Uh, those are some of the six main virtues that are common to both. In this diagram, you can see uh, the, the, the four different systems as they're spelled out. And this diagram uh, is also in your PowerPoints, in your notes, and it's adapted from um, Carolyn Baird's book, uh, Everyday Ethics, Making Wise Choices. So I hope this is helpful to you. I know we've covered a lot of ground in a short space of time, but think about these things. Think about your conscience. What is your moral framework? And as you do your reading, I hope those things will really be foremost in your mind. Thanks so much.